Is everybody outside seated? There is space on the other side here. There's an open table if you want to occupy it. Harni, is everybody in? So, good evening. Once again, welcome to the session of Thai Institute. We've actually had these sessions for a few years now, nine to be precise, and we're coming to the end of these sessions and courses. We probably will finish up the Institute this year. I'm also coming off the board at that time. But it's my pleasure to introduce Dave to you tonight, and I'll do that in a minute. He was introduced to me by a fellow charter member called Jay Ravat, who had heard him at one of these sessions and told me about him, and it didn't take me long to figure out this would be a very special evening. So again, welcome. I want to introduce you to Kiran Malhotra. She was standing here a minute ago. Did she leave? Oh, there she is. Please stand up, Kiran. She is the executive director of Thai. Please say hello. Hello. <laughs> And uh, there are also a number of charter members in the room that would be very nice for you to meet and network with. Uh, so without further ado, let me tell you, the restrooms are over through the corridor or on the right. Please switch off your cell phones and let me get on to introducing Dave. So Dave, how many of you think you've got attention deficit disorder? <laughs> a few of you. Well, a clinical psychologist said he had off the charts attention deficit disorder once when he was diagnosed. So this guy is, I'm gonna to wait to see how he presents and how much focus he actually has. He's a well-known author. He's appeared on a number of TV shows, a number of programs, a number of networks. He is an author of many books, the most famous of which, at least the one I liked very much, was called The Myth of Multitasking. He's also written a book on the secret, secret of being irreplaceable, I think, right? And uh, I am very pleased that he's here. He's very humorous. He's been quoted by Chuck Norris in the official Chuck Norris fact book. These are all little vignettes about his background. He's got a diagnosis that a personal challenge that CEOs and their fast businesses have got is to improve the focus of their business, not only their business, but of themselves. And I think this is what this session is about. I hate to tell you, some of you who think this is gonna be a restful evening, it's not designed to be that. He's got workshops, so he's got a little lesson for you to participate with, so you're gonna to have to work today. This is a real workshop, it's not a lecture. So without further ado, let me introduce Dave Crenshaw. Thank you. All right, so um, yes, he is, he is right. You're not going to, uh, I, I'm not going to get in front of that again, by the way. Uh, and it sounds like we're getting just a little feedback. I don't know if it's for both these mics. Oh, he's, he's yeah. Okay, he's got it. Um, so, uh, this is a real honor for me to be here. I did not know really anything about uh, Thai prior to the invitation, and I've taken a lot of time to get to know about this organization, and it's really dear to my heart. Um, I'm a real big, um, supporter of entrepreneurship and using entrepreneurship I believe that the majority of the problems that, that we face in any country from an economic standpoint can be solved through entrepreneurship so um, I'm it's great to be a part of that and support that uh, right now so we're gonna be together for a while right so I want to take just a little bit of time uh, for you to get to know me, and I'm going to take some time to get to know you. Um, as he mentioned, um, uh, I have uh, the myth of multitasking, which I'm going to talk about today. Also, invaluable: the secret to becoming irreplaceable. Uh, and uh, it's been published in six languages. I've appeared in Time Magazine, Forbes, MSN Money. Uh, recently, um, uh, what am I? 
I'm blanking right now, but anyway, Sirius XM Radio, BBC, oh, Washington Post. Um, personally, uh, I am from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. I have two children and one wife. <laughs> Just checking to make sure you heard about that. Okay. These are, my, these are my kids. This is my boy Stratton. He's six. And my daughter, Ella, she just turned two. Uh, and they are, uh, along with my wife, they're the joy of my life. And uh, after them comes entrepreneurship and business. Uh, I began working with business owners as a small business coach uh, in 98, before really people even knew that they could call themselves business coaches. It seems like now there are so many people that say, I'm a business coach. I started in 98. And I'm going to answer one question that I know some of you have, which is, I am 36. Um, I have learned from experience that it's important for me to say that early. I once spoke in an event, and the gentleman who hired me to speak at the event, he met me at the hotel beforehand, and he went back to his wife and said, I think we're breaking child labor laws by having him come speak. Well, I, um, I started when I was 23, so I started actually prior to graduating from uh, college in coaching businesses. Uh, and if you think that that's a hard sell, imagine me about 20 pounds lighter. Uh, I was about, I, I, it was very, it was a very tough sell for me to go into uh, men and women, into their business, and I'm, you know, two to three times younger than they are about how I can help them with their business. The reason why I could is because I was coming from a standpoint of systems, and I'm going to talk to you about that a lot today. Uh, he did mention before um, that uh, Chuck Norris is my biggest fan. Um, I got an email from my wife with that in the subject line, and uh, it's, she said, Chuck Norris is your biggest fan. I thought, well, what are you talking about? Have you heard the Chuck Norris facts? You, anyone throw one off the top of their head? A good Chuck Norris fact? Chuck Norris makes onions cry. <laughs> Chuck Norris made a milkshake once and it registered 9.7 on the Richter scale. Yeah. Right? Those kinds of things. Well, under, in, the, in the official Chuck Norris fact book, he has a fact that Chuck can kill two stones with one bird. And he talks in it about how he doesn't believe in multitasking and then quotes me. So just keep in mind, if you don't like this presentation, Chuck will come over to your house and give you 10 reasons to like this presentation, right? Okay, now, I want to get to know you a little bit. I want you to start by answering this question. If you had an extra 40 hours per month, every single month, what would you do with that time? You could get all the work done that you felt you needed to, but you got it done in 40 less hours per month, what would you do with that extra time? Read? Watch more TV. <laughs> What's your favorite show? Suits. That's a good show. I personally favor Burn Notice myself. That's a good one. All right. Other ones? Focus on a, on a single project. Okay. A project? Yeah. A sleep. Personal project. Exercise, sleep. Right. Right? <laughs> All right, great. We can um, pass those uh, work workbooks out now. By the way, um, anyone come to mind about like spending more time with with family or loved ones, something like that, come to mind, right? Um, anyone think do nothing, right? Because you feel like you're doing so much now that it would be nice to just do nothing. Now. The reason why I start with that question is because, really, that's what this workshop is designed to do. Now, to get you the full 40 hours uh, every single month, that's very difficult for me to do in a three-hour presentation that's really a very condensed version of about a two-day process that I take my CEO clients through. Um, but I'm going to get you as much of that as I can. So we're probably going to get around 20 hours per month at the end of this workshop, and you're going to understand where that time specifically is coming from. Um, all right. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about 
the philosophy of how I work with my clients so that you understand what I'm going to teach you. Um, my company, Invaluable Incorporated, when we work with a business, we're coming from two different perspectives at the same time. Typically, if, you, uh, if you're dealing with, like, let's say, a consulting company, they're dealing with the bottom. They're dealing with uh, the management, the front line, they're training people. And if you're dealing with a coach, they're dealing with just the CEO at the top. What we're trying to do is teach philosophies to both sides of, of the, the organization chart at the same time so that they meet in the middle. And what I'm going to do is teach you the process, the day one process that I begin with every single CEO that I work with. Every single business owner that I work with must go through this training, or at least a longer version of this training, prior to me working with them. Because I know that there is one truth that's more important than any other truth when it comes to owning a business. And that is, the business is the reflection of its leader. Right? The business is the reflection of the leader. If the business owner or the CEO at the top is disorganized and they're behind and they don't have enough time to complete things, guess what happens to projects? Guess what happens to the way that the, the, the employees operate? Because they see that and they feel that they can emulate that. So, let's figure out where you're at right now. We are going to work on the personal system side of things. So there's the business systems and the personal systems. Business systems, everyone in this room is familiar with the concept of business systems, right? Right? Processes, procedures, standard operating procedures, whatever you want to call it. Personal systems, though, are the way that you as an individual operate, as a person. When an idea comes into your head, when you're sitting in this room, what do you do with that idea? When someone hands you their business card, what do you do with that business card? What's the process that you take that through? When, it, when you sit down in front of your computer and, and you open up an email, what do you do with that email? My experience is that with most people, you're reinventing the wheel every single time. You don't have a system, you're just kind of making it up as you go along. What happens in a business if your employees make things up as they go along? Chaos? Yeah. Sometimes it'll be great, and sometimes it'll be an embarrassment <laughs> to your business, right? What we want is consistency. So what I want to do is give you systems to help you get consistent. So there are three groups of people that I'm used to working with when I give a presentation like this, and I'll break this down. The first one I call the Zen Master. And the Zen Master has always been organized. He or she has always been in control of their time, turns in things on time, has everything in its proper place, shows up for meetings early, effortless, just glides through life without any effort at all when it comes to the concept of management and, time and organization. In fact, even having someone like me speak about the concept of time management is a little bit foreign to them because to them they just think that's just the way things are. It's not an issue for me. Now, how many people in this room identify with this and would call themselves the Zen master? Be honest. Is there one? Okay. <laughs> and in my experience, it's about one in a hundred. So we're about right, okay? About one person in a hundred. So if that one person in, in a hundred were here, I would just say, my job is to help you, help the other people around you that are so screwed up, stop messing your life up, okay? Now, the next group, I call the lost soul. Now the lost soul is inherently organized. You like to be on time. You like to have things in their place. You crave order, but something's happened in the last 10 to 15 years, hasn't it? Something strange has gone on in your life, and suddenly you're finding yourself unable to keep up with everything that needs to go on, and you find yourself unable to put things in order, and you're finding yourself falling a little bit behind, and it's very, very frustrating to you 
because that's not who you feel you are deep inside. How many of you would identify with the lost soul? Okay, and that's about right. A little bit more than half is what I see with that. So if I can help you get back to where that place was, and in fact show you where you lost your way, so that you can get back to that state of order, would that be of value to you? Okay, that's what I'm gonna do with this process. Now the last group. The last group I call the pig pen. And the pig pen has never been organized, has never really been on time or put things together. Now that's not to say that they have not been successful, right? I've met many very successful pig pens, but they do it in spite of that natural tendency toward chaos and that natural tendency toward disorder. They succeed because of their creativity. They overcome that obstacle, but the whole concept of time management is just this foreign thing and, and frankly they've tried it and they've wasted lots of money on it and, and oh, they're worried they're going to lose their creativity by getting to that point. How many of you would identify with the pig pen, to be honest? Okay. And there are a bunch of people who haven't raised their hand. I'm going to put you in that category. Usually that's a little less than half, okay? Now, if I can show those people who are inherently disorganized how to be organized but not lose that creativity, not lose that ability to build relationships with people, would that be of value to you? Great. Now, last question, and unfortunately, I should have given him, the, I should have prepped you with the right bio because it kind of kills the thunder on this one. Which of the three do you think I fall into? The Zen master, the lost soul, or the pig pen? The Zen master. I mean, raise your hand if you feel I fall into the Zen master category. Okay, number two, how about the lost soul? And number three, how about the pig pen? Okay. Well, if you said the pig pen, you'd be correct. Now, if you saw the way that I operate now, you would think that I am the Zen master. And I'm fooling you. Because inherently, my nature is to create chaos. And I tell you that at the beginning. I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about that so that you understand that the person talking to you about time management and being organized and staying on top of things is not what I affectionately call a sadistic sock organizer. We sit, let that sink in for a second, okay? I am not a sadistic sock organizer. I do not like to alphabetize my spice rack, all right? That is not who's talking to you. I am, well, I'm just like most of you. I'm an entrepreneur. I want to move fast. I want to go quickly. I want action, not analysis. Let's get to it. And I know that if I am going to give personal systems to a group like this, I need to do it in a way that is as brainless as possible. Not because you don't have a brain, but because your brain is so occupied on things that are much more important than what I'm going to talk to you about, right? So I need to give you shortcuts. Now, <coughs> This is what my office used to look like. It's not the exact picture, but it's pretty darn close. Uh, one of these times I'm going to have to have like a video of my wife telling you what it was like to live with me as recently as seven years ago. You had to use a shovel to get from the, to the, front, from the front door to the desk. It was that difficult. And my chaos was not just physical, it was also internal. It was a matter of focus. I'm just going to try and take you really quickly through a tour on my career path right here. I started out in college as a business coach, but after a while I got bored with that so I became a religious youth educator. But not feeling like that was making me enough money, I took my hand as a sales executive. But I didn't really feel like that filled my creative urge, so I became a rock star and had a band. Yes, that's me right there my bass player. But you can't make money as a musician, as everyone knows, so I started a music booking business. Okay? Now, at about this moment, if you're a sane person, you should be asking yourself, what in the world is this guy doing standing up in front of me right now? How in the world can you write a book about time management organization and, you know, have it published in six languages? Is this a waste of my time? Well, there's part 
of the story that's really important. These are the clients that I worked with, and many, many more. These are just pictures that I, I've, they've given me over years. All these people I have helped get their business to the point where it's smooth, where it's orderly, where they're on top of their time. But before I could help them, I had to help me. Because I was so darn messed up. I had to help my family. My wife living with me was complete, it was horrible for her. And she couldn't have this sort of jumping around from, from career to career problem. I knew that I, as I sat down and I analyzed it, it was about the time that my son was going to be born, so about seven years ago, I said, you know what, this, this needs to change. <laughs> I, I don't want to stay up late at night in bars, playing to a crowd, having some guy come up to me and say, hey, we're going to get some weed. That's not the kind of environment where I wanted to raise a family. And so I decided to go back to business coaching. But I realized that if I was going to go back to business coaching, I had to become a paragon of productivity. I had to be somebody who lived the principles that I was teaching to my clients. So I went to a psychologist. Right? That's what you do when you're messed up. <laughs> so I went to the psychologist and I said, Mr. Psychologist, something's not, not right with me. I'm disorganized. I'm all over the place. I'm doing this. He gave me a text. He said, hmm, that's really interesting. Let me give you another text. And he said, has anyone ever talked to you about ADHD? I said, ADHD? That's not me. I'm not the kid that was climbing all over the walls. He said, well, there are two different kinds of ADHD. There's the kind that everyone thinks about that's the kid running all over the place, climbing all over the walls and getting into everything. And then there's the other kid that would be sitting in school drawing a picture. Everyone else would go out to recess. The lights would turn out. He'd be all by himself. And he wouldn't even realize that anyone else had left the room. I said, oh, that's me. Now, this presentation is not about attention deficit disorder. This is for you to understand my story in a point at which where I got to so I can teach you what I'm teaching you right now. The psychologist said, and these are word for word what he said, he said, you are freaking off the charts ADHD. If there were a fifth standard deviation, you'd be in it. I can say with 99.99% accuracy, you've got it. It was at that point that I decided to lean on my training of systems to overcome it. This is where we're coming back to the part where I'm talking to you. My background was on business systems. I knew how to help business owners overcome their problems with businesses by implementing systems. So what I did was put together systems for me first. As brainless as I can make it, understanding that I was ADHD, off the charts, whatever, and I was entrepreneurial to the core, I needed it as easy and as simple as possible. So I studied the best time management techniques and everything out there and then put together a system that was as simple and as brainless as possible and focused on the personal systems. Once I had that unlocked, then I could start teaching it to my clients and then I made it mandatory for them to go through the process and learn some of the things that I'm going to teach you right now. And this is where it comes to you. How many of you feel like that's the world we live in right now? Right? How many of you saw this guy on your way to work today? Okay? How many, was, how many people were this guy on the way to work today? Okay? This is the world that we live in. We have become conditioned to believe that multitasking is effective. Now, how many of you have heard, prior to this presentation, some study by some academic institution saying that multitasking is a bad thing for you? You know, okay? Did that change your behavior? Beyond a couple of days. Right? And part of it is because of the, the societal conditioning that we have. See, a lot of people joke and say, oh, I've got ADD, I've got ADHD. Genetically speaking, folks, most of you don't have it. Sorry to break it to you. Only about, at most, 8% of the population has the genetic predisposition to this condition called attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity disorder, whatever you want to call it. What most of you have 
is what I call SAS, S-A-S-S. -S. And SAS stands for Short Attention Span Syndrome. It is a learned behavior. Who is to blame for this learned behavior? Where did this come from? You know, I did a lot of studying on this. My background in systems teaches me that if you want to solve a problem, you've got to get to the root of the problem. So I went back, did all the studying I could, and I got to the root of the problem. Do you know what I found? Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore. Right? Because he invented the internet. Right? He's the one that did this to us. Now, of course, all joking aside, that is the point right around that time when the internet, when technology, multitasking as applied to human beings wasn't even a term we used prior to Windows. That's where the term came from originally. It was just this concept that, wow, the computer could multitask. Then we started to adopt that philosophy as a way to cope with the speed of information. There's a very important number that you need to You've got the workbook, you've got that down in front of you, 28%. This isn't my number, this comes from Basics Research out of New York. Basics is a, is a decent sized firm that does very large studies for companies to improve productivity. And what they found is that the average knowledge worker loses 28% of their time due to interruptions and the recovery time associated with those interruptions. Now I'm going to use the term switches and switching cost. 28% of your day is lost due to every time your attention switches from one thing to something else and the transition time between them. Okay, we're going to do a little exercise to illustrate that. But before we do that, I want to put that in real terms for you. If you, let's just say, 50, you're working 50 hours a week and you're worth $50 an hour. That means the bottom line impact to your productivity per week is $700 a week that you're losing. And this isn't because you're wasting time talking about sports around the water cooler or spending lots of time on YouTube watching videos of cats laughing. This is due to just the transition time between those different things. Basex estimated the cost of the US economy at $900 billion. But here's a better way to look at it. Think about the last month that you worked. Now, which one of those weeks could you have just gotten rid of? Because that's what you did. One week out of every month that you work is just complete garbage. It's meaningless. You remember that question I asked you at the beginning? What would you do if you had 40 hours per month? This is where the time's coming from, is that switching cost. So we're going to do a little exercise with each other right now so that you can understand this firsthand very quickly. So in your workbook, you should have a, a document that looks a little bit like this. Now, at the top of that paper, you're going to see a phrase, multitasking is worse than a lie. I'll just explain where that comes from. How many of you heard this saying? There are lies, damned lies, and statistics, right? Mark Twain is credited with that. It's in a little bit of dispute, but anyway. I say there are lies, damned lies, and multitasking. Multitasking is worse than a lie because it's something that we've been culturally conditioned to believe is true. So, you're going to experience that firsthand. This is how the exercise is going to go. Don't start until I say go. On the first row, you're going to just simply recopy the phrase, multitasking is worse than a lie. Don't start until I say go. On the second row, you're going to write the numbers 1 through 27. That's it. Pretty simple, right? And I'm going to time you. I'm going to call out time. You just write down the approximate time at which you finish. We need to give a second for everybody to get pens. 
Any questions about what we're about to do? Okay, pretty easy, right? All right. So just write that, just write the phrase across, write the numbers. Ready? Get set. Go. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Fifteen seconds. Twenty seconds. Twenty five. 30, when you're done, just write your approximate time. This side. 35, we'll go five more. And 40, and stop. Looks like most of you should be done at that point. Okay, great. Now, can you see where we're headed with this? Next time, this time I want you to do the same thing. Recopy the phrase, multitasking is worse than the line, write the numbers 1 through 27. But... This time you're going to switch. So for every letter that you write, you're going to write a number. So rather than writing it across, you're going to write M, and then 1, and then U, and then 2, and then L, and then 3, and so on. Got it? Okay. Let me get to the right spot here. Get ready. Get set. And go. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Fifteen. Twenty. Twenty-five. Thirty. 35, this is where most of you stopped last time. 40. 45. 50. 55. 60, we'll go 10 more seconds. 65, and 70, and if you're not done there, just give up. So the great thing about doing this exercise as a group is that you can hear what's happening, right? You can hear the difference between the two. So let's talk about the three impacts of multitasking. What's the first impact that was really obvious to you? Slows you down, right? The amount of time it takes to complete things when you multitask increases. On average in this group, it's usually between 50% and, and double. Is that what you found? Somewhere around there. Now, some people may say, well, this is a really simple exercise. That's not what it's like in real life. I mean, I know what you're simulating, but that's not what it's like. This is what it's like in real life. Sitting at my computer and typing away, I'm really engaged. In it. I'm, I'm excited. And I just poke my eye. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in it. And then all of a sudden, someone knocks on the door. Right? You're just still typing away. And they come in and open the door and they say, "Excuse me, I've got just a quick question. Right? Just a quick question. It's the dread of double Q." So I stop. Let's say that I stop and I don't try to answer the question and type the email at the same time, which would be lots of multitasking, or what I call switch tasking. But instead I stop. I answer the question. Yes, the answer is 42. Thank you very much. They turn and leave to go. Now what do I need to do? Right. I need to think about where was I in the email, what was I thinking about, where was I? Or if you're really off the charts ADHD like me, you'll, you'll look at that and you'll see a piece of paper on your desk and you go, oh my gosh, I forgot to finish that piece of paper, and you start getting involved in the piece of paper, and two hours later the email's still on the screen, unresolved, unsent. 
No one's ever, oh, Elsie's has experienced that, right? Okay. This illustrates a little concept called switching cost. Switching cost is usually applied in an in a economics or finance sense. And it just means the transition time from using one provider to another. Well, when you switch back and forth between your day, you're incurring micro-switching costs. And every little switch that you made between those letters increases the amount of time. Every little switch that you add between one email and another, and one conversation and another, and one thought process and another, and answering the phone and jumping to writing down, all that switching back and forth, you incur lost time, switching costs. And nothing happens during that time. Zero productivity. Nothing. In 2006, Microsoft did a survey among its programmers and found that the average programmer when interrupted took, any guesses how long it took them to recover when interrupted from programming? 15. Give that man a prize. 15 minutes. Now, we're not always software programming, right? But when you couple that with a study out of UC Irvine that said that the average knowledge worker can only go 11 minutes until interrupted, you start to see how the math has a problem, right? Even if it only takes you two minutes to recover, pretty soon your entire day is caught up in nothing but switches and switching costs. This is where that feeling comes from at the end of the day. And you're so tired, and you get home, and you put your feet up on the desk, and your spouse comes to you and says, how was your day? Oh, I was, I was working hard. Great, what did, you, what did you do today? Right? That's where that feeling comes from, where you don't know what you actually accomplished, because all you did was doing nothing, switching around back and forth to these things, feeling very busy the whole time. Okay? Second consequence of, of multitasking. Take a look between the first time and the second time that you did this. How about the quality? How does the spacing look? The numbers? The writing? How many of you ended up on a number, be honest, a number other than 27 at the end of this? Okay? We did this before. You realize that, right? We did this exercise before. I told you that the number was 27 multiple times, yet you ended up on a number that was different than that. Now, how does this happen in your day? How many times have you seen a very simple task delegated <coughs> to a highly intelligent individual, a college-educated individual? It was given in written instructions, step-by-step, step, exactly what was supposed to be done, exactly by what time, and they still find a way to screw it up. You seen this happen? Is that because they're stupid? No. It's a symptom of multitasking. Whenever you see highly intelligent people making ridiculously stupid mistakes for things that they know what they should be doing, that is almost always a symptom of switch tasking. Okay? And the last effect. This one isn't so obvious until I ask you to think about it. But think about how you felt between the first time and the second time you did this exercise. Right? First time, how did it feel? No big deal, I'm just writing numbers and letters, right? The second time, how did it make you feel? Right? It becomes, becomes a little bit stressful and painful. Now some of you might actually like that, which is sick. <laughs> and you need help. No. But, but that stress, is also a symptom of multitasking. Think about this. How many times since you were four or five years old have you been copying numbers and letters off the board? Yet the moment we introduce switch tasking into the equation, it becomes painful and laborious and difficult. Is it little wonder that in a world that we live in right now that has so many time-saving devices and so many stress-relieving outlets that we are more stressed out and have less time than we've ever had in the history of the world. Okay? So, just in summary, three consequences of multitasking are, number one, the amount of time it takes to complete things increases. The quality of the work that you do decreases. 
And number three, the stress levels that you experience increase. Now I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions before we get into the systems, um, but I want to respond to two objections first, because I know these questions are coming, so I'm going to respond to them. First question is, well, Dave, what about if I'm exercising on the treadmill and watching TV at the same time? Isn't that multitasking? Isn't that effective? Well, it's part of the reason why in my book, The Myth of Multitasking, I make a, a differentiation between switch tasking, which is rapidly switching back and forth between tasks like we're talking about, and background tasking. And background tasking, interestingly, I was just uh, uh, up at Pixar earlier today. I've got a, a very good friend who works uh, for Pixar, and he was talking about how he'll start the computer rendering a shot, and he'll go work on something else. That's background tasking. When it doesn't require your effort or attention, where something's happening in the background, then that can actually be productive. So when I'm running on the treadmill, I'm not having to think about where my feet are going. At least I hope I'm not. <laughs> But I can, just, I can just watch the TV, right? Any other examples of background tasking you can think of? Eating while driving. Eating while driving. <laughs> I think I passed you on the way up here, right? Some of, some of that picture was multitasking and other, other parts were background tasking. You think so, huh? Okay. By the way, do you know what a study out of University of Utah said about um, talking on the phone while driving? It is as dangerous as what? Driving while intoxicated. Why? Now this is important, but why is very, very important here. It's not because your judgment is impaired. It's because of the switching cost. You see, when something unexpected happens to a drunk, their reaction time is slow. When something unexpected happens to you and you're engaged in some conversation or heaven forbid text messaging, your attention time is delayed to the point in which you're, as if you're drunk. So the, the whole question of driving while talking, my question is, are you switch tasking or are you background tasking? If I'm driving through the city, that's going to require my attention constantly, right? But if I'm driving on the stretch of freeway, I-80 from California to Utah, and it's wide open stretch of road and there's nothing around, then you can make your own judgment call as to whether or not that's as risky. Make sense? Because there's not going to be as many switches. Okay, so that's the first objection. Second objection is, finish the sentence for me, women can multitask. Multitask. <laughs> they say it boldly. And, and men can't, right? Why is that? I <laughs> Right. Well, bless your heart, that's great, because what you're saying is, let me repeat what she just said in, in my own words. I find it very difficult to do things in a very slow and unproductive way. <laughs> right? Here's the thing about that. Is there evidence that a woman can make switches faster than a man? Or that your 12-year-old, addicted to their phone, can make switches faster than you, you old geezer. Yes, but, what's the but on that? If they did one thing at a time, they would still be faster and more effective than when they try to multitask. Make sense? So it doesn't matter whether women can multitask and men can't. It doesn't matter whether kids can switch their attention faster than adults can. The point is that when you do one thing at a time, no matter how fast someone else is at making their switches, the person who does one thing at a time is always going to be faster. Um, I, there was actually a study out of Vanderbilt about this uh, that said you can improve your multitasking ability. And so newspapers saw that and they ran the headlines, you can get better at multitasking. So I actually went one step further and asked the professors, just curious, are you saying that the people who did thing that got better at multitasking were faster than the people who were doing one thing at a time? And they said, oh no, absolutely not. If you do one thing at a time, you're always faster. So when you hear someone say, 
I'm really good at multitasking. Just here, I'm really good at messing multiple things up at the same time. Okay? Because that's what they're saying. So, um, I'm going to start going into the systems. Before I do that, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about what this is costing us and what multitasking is. Any questions you have at this point, please? example you had of somebody knocking on your door and asking uh, for a doctor's question, it seems to me that if you focus on you as an individual in that example, it makes sense because you're focusing on the switching costs there. But if you didn't do that, and I'm, I'm assuming you're going to give us some way to work around these problems, but if you didn't do that, and that person gets hung up because they don't have the answers to the question they need, then as a group, you as an organization or as a team or whatnot, might have a roadblock um, right. in that example. And so I wonder, you know, hopefully you know, I'm assuming you'll get to this, but there is a reason why people interrupt each other, even though they know that maybe it's not great in many situations. And it's because you don't want any one thing to basically have to wait for an answer or their piece of the puzzle um, while someone else is being productive. So I was wondering if you could speak to that at some point. Yeah, uh, and the answer is I will. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with you. And those kinds of interruptions have to take place. So the question that we're gonna explore is, how can we deal with those, but less often? The key isn't to get completely rid of the switches that are taking place in your day, but to reduce the number of switches that are taking place in your day. Because a lot, a lot more switches are happening in your day than need to happen. And that's what we're going to get to. Great. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, isn't there a fourth sort of hidden uh, cost to multitasking? Um, you call it SAS, but since the, the late 90s, I've seen people um, be thrown into an environment where they had to multitask, um, you know, a lot, many, many meetings, and seeing their short-term, I call it short-term memory disease, I saw them get, um, um, have more and more difficulty focusing on any one thing. So whether they have ADD characteristics or, you know, ADHD uh, tendencies or not, um, they would become uh, uh, very ineffective at focusing on any one thing for longer than, you know, short periods of time. Right. Well, I mean, basically what you're saying is what we know about brain science, which is the more often you do something, the easier it becomes to do something. Uh, which is why you, it's when you develop habits that are good, they're so powerful, and why when you develop habits that are so bad, it's so hard to get rid of them. It's because your brain is basically woven a channel down one pathway. Well, if you continually switch throughout your day, You've told your brain, this is the way to operate. This is the way to look at things. This is the way to handle it. And you're telling your brain to do things in a very, very hurtful way. Uh, to you, to the people around you. There is a fourth uh, effect that I'm going to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about it now because I'd like to save that to the end. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that you run into when you're looking at people development and leader development is if you have an individual that actually tries not to multitask, he often gets branded as he's really not leadership material because he can't handle all of these different things. And he's, mm -hmm. you know, that's career limiting in some cases in, uh, in your growth up the ladder. Right. What do you think about that? Well, and it's why I love talking to this group. And I'll tell you why. Um, the business is a reflection of the owner. And this problem is best solved from, from the top buying into it. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was speaking to a very large construction firm. They asked me to come speak to their estimators. Uh, what do estimators do in a construction firm? Anyone tell me? Right. Yeah. And, and ultimately, they create the bid, right? To, for a, I mean, we're talking about multi-million dollar buildings that they're, they're putting together. So when one of those people takes too long or makes mistakes, what's the cost to the business? It's huge. So they were asking me to speak to them, and, and one of the um, estimators brought up that, that very concern that you brought up. Well, if I do this, Dave, if I stop, if I try to implement these things, then people are going to feel like I'm holding them down. 
the CEO was sitting right on the front row. And he stood up and he said, listen, people, if we have ever given you the impression that, we, that you need to work long hours and you need to do these kinds of things and you need to sacrifice your family, then, then right now I want to change that. This is not the way we do things here. Now, you can see the power behind that when I've got the CEO saying that to everyone in the room. It's much more difficult when I'm trying to do it at the bottom alone. And that's why I showed that illustration in the beginning, because my hope is that most of the people I'm talking to here are either starting their company or they're in a position where they can make that kind of influence within their business and create that kind of culture from the start. Any other questions? There's one other approach that I have heard called priority tasking, which means you just focus on the few tasks that are important, and then leave the others that you have no important tasks to deal with. Yeah, um, let me hold off on commenting that, and then if, if, if what I talk about doesn't address that later on, then let's then, then bring it up again. I'll be glad to talk more about that. Because you're, you're right, but uh, I'm going to get into that stuff more. Any other questions about multitasking itself? Okay. How are we doing on time? All right. Do we need to take a break?